You, but we decided to present you a little film before I give my presentation, so hopefully it works out. I'm happy to be here because it was the first time that I was asked now to give a presentation where I was immediately very influenced by the first speaker, Stephen, <coughs> Professor Stephen Hendricks, because he was telling that in his field of work they were working about repairing the brain and enhancing the brain function, well, that's exactly what I do. I try to take people on a journey and try to convince them that we have to live more sustainable and that this is very, very possible. So it's also about designing, about the brains. And when I hear, heard the Professor Zweigenberg, he was uh, telling or appealing for bridging. Bridging artists, bridging scientists, region designers. But he said, well, there is a lot of complexity there, uh, ethical, and so on and so forth. But then the moderator of the day told me the story I wanted to tell, because he said, well, is there no problem of language? And I think this is all about language, because I can tell my story, I and mean, this will be a story about biodiversity, of course, but we have to understand each other, and language is very important in that. And people who know me, they know that I really like to tell stories, so I start to tell a little uh, story. So imagine there's a, um, a mother in a kitchen together with her daughter of eight years, and she's preparing lunch. And the mother is going to the refrigerator, and she take some sausages out of the fridge and then before she lay them in the frying pan she takes the scissors and she chops off both endings of the sausages before laying them in the frying pan and the little daughter is asking her mommy mommy what are you doing and she said well I'm chopping the endings of the sausages and then I'm frying them but why are you doing that, mom? She said. And the mom answered, Well, because of Pierre. Because I don't know. But my mom told me so. So maybe you have to ask your grandmother. She knows. So later that week, the grandchild was questioning her grandmother and said, Grandma, when you are frying sausages, how, how do you do it? Well, I take them out of the fridge and I chop both endings and then lay them in the frying pan. But why are you doing that? Well, because of, yeah. I don't know. But your grand grandmother learned me. My mother learned me that, so that's your grand grandmother. So maybe you better ask her, maybe she knows. Some weeks later, they met and she asked the same question. And do you know what the grand grandmother answered? See, she answered, Do you still fry sausages in such a small frying pan? <laughs> now, the reason why I tell you this story, this story is we have to question ourselves. We have to question ourselves why are we doing the things we are doing? And then I think it's very wise to integrate disciplines, to integrate. Uh, competences and talk about it. This is a picture of, I think, the end of the 1960s and people were leaving on holidays.
that's the only way we could go on holidays when we go far, further away by train because cars weren't that uh, many at the time. With a big plan to go to Corsica, in this uh, case, how to, do, to deal with it. And we went to beautiful places and it was fantastic. But the population is growing very fast and you see that now it is estimated that we will grow globally with the population up to 9 billion people. So a big problem. And also a big problem because we need to move and the cars came there, came there and really, really in huge amounts and well, this is our daily life. We, are, we have to live somewhere, so we started to build buildings nearly everywhere in the world. And we have the Americans with the big dreams, with their way of life. And this is the way of life, the big dream of every American, nearly every American. Get in a plane fly to the most remote places in the world, step down and immediately, immediately fish the most freshwater fishes. And then with a good cup of coffee, it must be fantastic. This is a trick for the photograph, of course. But this is how most Americans would like to live. We have not only Americans, we have ourselves or the big Germans. Eh? But, uh, well, tourism. tourism is a really huge problem for biodiversity, for nature. It's the biggest threat, I think, of one of the biggest threats for nature. So, we have to watch out, we have to take care of that. But I think that sustainable tourism is one of the biggest opportunities for nature. If we can design it, if we can organize it. Now we are sitting also outside in the snow, not only on the beach. So we are trying to do things, but there is something going on with our globe. This is not a tricked photograph. This is a photograph of the first ski areas who, where, where the, the snow is disappearing very quickly every season. And the only way to get the snow is putting in big machines, and causing you know, troubles, of course, because the carbon dioxide in the air is increasing very fast. Up to 380 parts per million at the moment is going really, really, really fast. And we know the rest. The carbon dioxide creates a, uh, a big carpet around our globe and so our globe is heating, is warm and you see that the temperatures, the surface temperatures are raising very fastly. We think we can narrow it down to 2 degrees but most of the scientists are telling me that we will conquer 3.5 degrees and then see if it stops there. With a lot of problems of course, caused by climate change. Australia were a big draw every year, uh, 230 billion liters of water are they lacking each year what they have to buy. So that's a big, big problem. Greenland, annual loss of 200 cubic kilometers, kilometers of ice. And I can go on like that. And it was, I think, Al Gore, with this inconvenient truth, who made us aware that there's a problem and we have to deal with that. We have to redesign, we have to design what we want to be. We have to know which future we, will, we want and how, in which world we want to live. The reported natural disaster disasters, you see that it is really increasing. We have 
tremendous problems nowadays. Streets floating, and you know that you can stop there. And then not by car, but by boat. But the only conclusion we can take is that people are responsible for climate change. And we are lucky. Well, I think yes, because we can do something about it. Because we are responsible for it, we cause this all. So hopefully, I think I can say we also can give a solution. You all know this animal, Tyrannosaurus rex, who didn't survive and was extinct 65 million years ago. Some other animals disappeared very quickly. This one for the Netherlands, all the people, the Dutch people here in the room, they were responsible for the extinction of this animal at Mauritius. The lost species was knocked down by the Dutch. It is reported, well, just, just a joke. You see, immediately they react. That's a good thing. But there are several, several uh, animals who were getting extinct. And there was a very interesting guy, I think, uh, Charles Darwin, who was maybe the most famous scientist in the world until now, who tried and did a lot of study work and on his journey with the beagle, but he came with this yeah, big known work on the origin of species by me of natural selection, where survival of the fittest, everybody knows these words, but now David Attenborough is pronouncing these words, is Charles Darwin, who was the man who was able to see how these, these things work. And what we see now is that they said that we are living in the sixth extinction phase because species are extinguishing very rapidly and uh, biodiversity loss can't be halted at, for the moment. So there's a problem. But the first thing you have to answer is how many species do we have? And the only answer we can give on that is that we don't know that. We don't know exactly how many species there are living in, at, our, at our globe. Because every day, that's a good news, there are new species discovered. And then just to give an example that in, uh, in the tropical uh, forest of Panama, uh, where was 19 trees was, were, was re were researched with 1,200 new beetle species discovered, and 80% of that were, at the moment, unknown for science. So, also good things. But if we don't know how many species there are, we don't know how many we are losing. But what we do know is that we are, is going very rapidly, and that the, the rapid loss is 1,000 to 10,000 times faster, higher, than the no normal natural extinction rate. So it is estimated that the rate of extinction is between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1. So then they make a calculation and it's very simple. If we think at the lowest estimate that there are 2 million species on Earth, then you see that we are losing every day between a half and 5.4 species, losing them every day. And if we look into the highest estimate, with 100 million species, we are losing up to 274 species a day. So normally it will be somewhere in between, but it's very, going very, very, very fast. And if we look into today, where the World Conservation Union, the largest nation conservation uh, umbrella organization in the world, who do research every year and the health check of our globe, you see that it is really happening, that biodiversity loss is there. One bird out of eight 
is treated, is threatened to an extinction. I can go on like that, but six marine turtles out of seven are threatened by extinction. So it is really a big problem. So you can ask yourself, yourself, where are the seals come to? Well, very simple answer. There's someone else on the beach. Is this the place where frogs have to live? It's a very endangered species, the tree frog now, but uh, with a glass of water. Is this the place where biodiversity, where nature will have their place, or is it something else? And what we do know that there is a correlation, there is a relation between biodiversity and climate change. Because a polar bear doesn't know how valuable he is. He is just crawling around. He doesn't know how he is affected by the changing of the climate. But we people, we know how valuable a polar bear is, or a tree frog, and so on. So it's up to us to make a change. And the way we are living, we are now using more than one globe to live, to work. So we have to do it more sustainable. We have to redesign, we have to design our lives so that we can live sustainable together in harmony with our planet. What can we do with it? As an international ambassador for biodiversity, I am uh, discussing a lot of times, and I also after this uh, presentation have to go to the European Parliament to discuss on the CAP reform, the Common Agricultural Policy. But what can we do? So you can try to make some policy on changing behaviors, on changing things. And the first thing they do is, well, <coughs> let's call out a decade for biodiversity. Last year was the year of biodiversity. The United Nations has, have uh, de declared now the next decade as a decade for biodiversity. That's a good thing because also now on the global level they know there's a serious problem. And then the next step is, well, let's try to make some agreements on the global level. All countries together to the conference of parties in Nagoya, in Japan, in Japan last year and also in Cancun, Mexico for the climate change. And the two key words for me I was in Japan, I was not in Cancun, but the two key words are integration, 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 and implementation, implementation, implementation. And integration is maybe the thing where today all of the parts trying to come together from different approaches and see what we can do for the future. And the next thing is implementation, because we can say, well, we're going to save biodiversity and then go home and do nothing. And then there is a big problem, of course. And if you ask people then, the, you know, the, the European Union does a lot of surveys about Natura 2000, you see, and maybe also in this uh, audience, a lot of people never heard of the Natura 2000, the nature network in Europe. And if we think that biodiversity and the environment is so important, well, if the, the European Union asks this, the inhabitants, what is the most important issue? The environment is only 4% uh, as important for the European citizens. So we have to mind the gap. That's a lesson for myself. Nature design. Can there be a rainbow? Can there be something that we can believe in, that we can live in harmony and sustainable with our globe. And what we see is that at different places in the world some new things are happening. And this is, I don't know if you know this, but it is meat water. Meat water is, a, is at this time a really hype in the western uh, part of the United States. And it's just food because the Americans they don't have time anymore to have a lunch at noon, so they let's try and do something different. 
And now you see, when you look into it very well, liver boost sandwich with the same calories, with the same smell, you can drink it and you have enough calories in your body and you have more time so in the evening they can socialize more. But nature can be very important for new designs like plants where uh, the, the, the velcro is coming from passive cooling, now the cooling down of, of, of buildings now we, are, we have buildings without uh, heating uh, systems based on uh, nature, species, and this is, I think, a good thing. Gecko tape, a lot of things. And I put in a uh, uh, picture of medicines because you have to know that almost 40% of all medicines that we are using <coughs> are coming from nature. We have electric cars, smart grids, veggie days, cradle to cradle principles. So maybe there's a good thing happening. So I think yes we can we can do a lot of good things and hopefully come into a good society and a good world. I was at the Darwin Center last month in London and even reindeer poo is now very hot. It was just before Christmas time, but I sp spotted this reindeer poo in a box for five pounds. And if you were lucky, there was a seed of a pine tree inside of it, and you have your own Christmas tree next year. And well, everybody was buying it. So, but just to give you an idea, when we think out of the box, a lot of things are possible. Well, this is a new model that. Uh, the United Nations and a lot of nature conservation organizations are working on and is that sustainable development what was developed with the triangle on, uh, where every part is an equivalent of itself now will go to a, a different type where the planet is the pillar of sustainable development. I won't go into detail on that but this ecosystem services are now very hot in the world because nature is far, far, far more than only species. They are regulating, they are regulating, supporting cultural services that supports, that, bring, that nature brings us. And I think this will be very important because you see when you look into the natural capital, capital uh, regarding the, the poverty reduction, we know the system of the, the, the gross dom domestic products, the GDP, all things who are in these terms or in these uh, structures are monetary things. And <coughs> when you see what is the ecosystem, what is the descent, the, the, what is the, the dependency of ecosystems in Indonesia, India and Brazil, in the just the, 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 the common uh, GDP, you see that ecosystem services, for instance, in, in Indonesia is 21%. Not a lot, you will say. But we're now discussing to bring in the GDP of the poor because ecosystem services are so important for poor people. When a river is poisoned in Indonesia, they can't wash themselves, they can't eat, and they die. And you can't see it in the GDP. That is some of the problem. So let's try to put in ecosystem services, also welfare into the GDP. The deep report is an answer to monetarize the ecosystem services. The ecosystem the deep report is the economics of ecosystem and biodiversity who try to give value to biodiversity. Finding new solutions, I have to go, how many times? Two minutes, oh, you, you, you. so I have to go very fast now. But finding new solutions, you have to look at places where you normally don't come. So maybe in this room, because a lot of experiences are here. I don't want to tell you that much about uh, my own organization. This, yeah, try and begin with yourself, with your own organization. And we developed a reconnection model that is now world 
wide known and, and is used in, in several parts of the world and it's so simple. It's trying to reconnect society with biodiversity, with nature, with all the specific things that there are uh, on, the, on the screen. So reconnecting society and involving citizens. That is what we're trying to do in a part or in this part in the province of Limburg. And it is very recognized now in other parts of the world. We're working together in France and the UK, but also in Cambodia and the United States and so on and so forth. So we try to look differently to nature. We try to party different in nature. We try to think out of the box where people or children can play. Well, I go very fast on that. There's also about econ the economics of, ecos of ecosystems. It's that we can really earn a lot of money with uh, biodiversity, six and a half million euros each year for uh, cycling. The whole camp National Park, the first national park in Belgium where everything began, but the national park, the first national park in the world was Yellowstone Park, and there is an inscription on the statue there for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people. Remember again, the value is in the eye of the beholder. We are responsible, so we are can, can also be part of the solution. I was just a hard-working guy with a hard-working group of very fantastic colleagues and then at once you get what they call the Green Nobel Prize and everything is possible. So nowadays it is possible for me to discuss with Elcor or with Nancy Pelosi or with the commissioner where I have to go to now in a minute or the European president. Strange because I'm not different than two years ago but it's because of a price that the door is open. Strange, but I try to use that, try to influence that. Start yourself, uh, just, yeah, this is too, too beautiful not to tell you this. Start with yourself, I'm an ontologist. This is the midwife toad, a very endangered species, a very rare species in our neighborhood. Living on a graveyard in those graveyard, in, in those uh, really big, little angles and the, the city decided to tear down all the graves where that was not visited by all saints because they have to create new space for people to die. So every grave that wasn't visited by all saints would, come, would, be, uh, would, would go, go away. So what I did, start with yourself, with like some flowers with all saints put them on the graves so that the graves could be there, so they're still there. And that's a good thing to start with yourself. Everything I did is with fantastic colleagues, partners who gave me the benefit of the doubt with everything I learned. I learned from nature and then now, and it's the last uh, five or six slides that I won't tell anything. Let, let nature inspire itself because what I can, you can do too. All things boil down to uh, changing behavior and, and starting with yourself of course is the, is the most important message um, but in the interna international scene um, changing uh, uh, well the discussion about changing reproductive behavior of, of the human uh, population uh, because in the end that is the biggest problem humans are the problem and the growing number of humans yeah. enlarges the problem is there room in the international scene to talk about that issue about really instead of saying well we are going to grow to 10 
billion people. Um, why not do things now to, to, to stop that growth yeah. to go to the... Yeah. Uh, the yes, there is definitely, but there are two main discussions on that. One, you have the, the, the track on what is told by credit to credit by Professor Browngard and McGon, who said, say that basically we, there are in weight more, there's more ants in the world than the human population. And if you count all the weight of all ants, there's more weight than humans are. And ants can live in harmony with our globe. So they say, well, it must be possible to you know, a very crowded globe to find solutions. That's on the one hand, one, one yeah, let's say move, and the other one is also, I think, triggered by Professor Vermeer, I think, uh, who is now saying, well, we have to deal with uh, the population, and we have to do something about it. So he, he is talking about what was in China for several years. Uh, do we have to, to go and try to find solutions to, yeah, not regenerate that fast? Uh, but there is another with the line in between. They are saying that where, where, where is the population growing the most is in the developing, con uh, developing countries. And what they say now, and what they see, and it's correct, I think, that once uh, a region is growing also economically and also intellectually, the, the amount of children decrease. And it's, well, that's what is going on in the world at the moment. 